In this lecture, we're going to talk about orthogonal sets. So recall that we defined the inner product of two vectors to be the sum of the products of the corresponding components of those vectors. And when that inner product, also called dot product, when that turns out to be the number zero, we said that the two vectors are orthogonal. And this generalizes the idea of what it means for two vectors in R2 or R3 to be perpendicular. Now when we have an entire set of vectors, we can say that that is an orthogonal set if every time we take two distinct vectors out of that set and take their inner product, what we get is zero. In other words, the vectors in the set are pairwise orthogonal. Every pair of the vectors in the set is an orthogonal pair of vectors. So here we have three vectors, and let's think about what we would have to do to check that this is an orthogonal set. Well, we have to take a bunch of dot products. For example, we have to look at u1 dot u2. That's going to be 3 times negative 1 plus 1 times 2 plus 1 times 1, and that does in fact work out to be 0. Now that's not all we have to check. We have to check some more things, but that's more evidence towards getting to where we want to get. Now notice that we don't have to also check that u2 dot u1 equals 0, because one of the, pro the properties that inner product has is that it's symmetric, and so u2 dot u1 is always equal to u1 dot u2, and so we get 0 there as well. We also have to check u1 dot u3. That's going to be 3 times negative a half plus 1 times negative 2 plus 1 times 7 halves and that again works out to be 0. Similarly, that means u3 dot u1 is 0. And then finally, we have to check u2 dot u3. That's going to be negative 1 times negative 1 half plus 2 times negative 2 plus 1 times 7 halves, and that again works out to be 0. So now that we've checked all of the different pairs that we could take out of this set, we now know that this is an orthogonal set. Notice that the more vectors we have in the set, the more checking we have to do. Now a theorem that should be somewhat surprising here is that if we have an orthogonal set of vectors, then that set automatically has to be linearly independent. And it might be surprising because the definition of orthogonality doesn't seem to have anything to do with linear combinations. But it does turn out that this theorem is true. So let's see how the proof goes. So how do we prove that a set is linearly independent? Well, we suppose that we have a linear combination of those vectors that equals the zero vector, and our goal then will be to show that each of the coefficients of that linear combination is the number zero. So as we think about how we might prove this theorem, we have to try to bring in the information about orthogonality. How are we going to use the fact that the vectors in this set are orthogonal? How do we introduce dot products? Well, what we're going to do is dot u1 by both sides of this equation. So we're going to take u1 dot the left-hand side, and that will, of course, have to equal u1 dot the right-hand side. Now, on the right-hand side, anytime we dot a vector with the zero vector, we get the number zero. And on the left-hand side, we're going to use the distributive properties that we learned about the dot product. So we distribute the u1 across all of the terms in the parentheses, and then so in the first case, we get u1 dot c1 u1 but then we can pull the c1 out. Similarly, we do that with each of the terms on the left-hand side. Now here's where the fact that this set of vectors is orthogonal works out, because u1 dot u2, that's going to be zero. The next thing in the, the dots here, that's u1 dot u3, that's gonna be zero. Zero, 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 and this last one, u1 dot up, that will also be zero. The only thing that will stick around is u1 dot u1. Now because we assumed that these vectors were non-zero, Remember that when we dot a vector with itself, what we get is the norm of that vector squared, in other words, the length of the vector squared, and a non-zero vector has a non-zero length, and so that number isn't zero. The product of these two numbers is zero, however, so one of them has to be zero, and if u1 dot u1 isn't zero, then c1 has to be zero. So that just proves that c1 equals zero, but we would do the exact same thing to prove that c2 equals zero. We would dot u2 on both sides of the original equation, and then we would get that c2 equals zero, and so on. Now, whenever we think about linearly independent sets, our mind should also think about bases. And so given a subspace of the vector space Rn, an orthogonal basis is simply a basis that is also an orthogonal set. An orthogonal set is automatically, by the theorem that we just proved, linearly independent. And so whatever set is spanned, whatever space is spanned by an orthogonal set of vectors, that orthogonal set is a basis for that space. Now, when we have an orthogonal basis for a space, any vector in that space can be written 
as a linear combination of those orthogonal vectors. So C1, C2, Cp, and so on. And the general problem of, okay, we have a basis for a subspace, we have a vector in that subspace, I know that in the abstract, that vector can be written as a linear combination of the basis vectors, but what are the actual coefficients? In general, the way we have to do that is we have to solve a matrix equation. But it turns out that when we have an orthogonal basis, finding those coefficients is actually much, much easier. The theorem says that when we have an orthogonal basis for a subspace and a vector in that subspace, the weights are simply given by this formula. All we have to do is take two dot products, divide one by the other, and that gives us the coefficient for each of the basis vectors. Okay, so why does that work? Well, we're going to pretty much do the same strategy that we did from the previous theorem. We're going to take the original equation, which said that y equaled this linear combination, and we're going to dot u1 on both sides. So we're just going to take the dot product of both sides by u1. On the left-hand side, we just get y dot u1, nothing we can really do with that. And on the right-hand side, we're going to use that distributivity again. So we get u1 dot ui, u2 dot ui, and so on, ui dot ui, and then finally up dot ui. But remember, the u's form an orthogonal set, and so that means that all of those dot products equal zero except the one that is ui dotted with itself. Ci is what we're looking for. Remember, we're trying to figure out what those coefficients are, so we're just going to divide both sides by ui dot ui. We know we're not dividing by zero because, since this is a basis, all of the basis vectors have to be non-zero. So ui dotted with itself is, again, the length of ui squared. That's not zero, so we're not dividing by zero. We don't have to worry about that. And so we get the formula that we're looking for. Now, a common problem in physics and some other fields is to decompose a vector into orthogonal components. So, for example, you have an object that's traveling at some angle, and you might want to decompose it into its horizontal component and its vertical component. So in this case, if my original vector is u, I might want to write it as, say, a vector h plus a vector v, where h and v are a little bit easier to understand because one's horizontal, one's vertical. So if I'm thinking about, for example, the effect of gravity, if gravity points down, then that only affects the vertical component, it doesn't affect the horizontal component. So this is a really useful thing that we sometimes want to do in these kinds of situations. Now a more general problem that we often have to think about is decomposing a vector into a sum of two vectors, one that's parallel to a given vector and one that's orthogonal to that given vector. So as, as an example, maybe we have an object that's traveling on a slope. So we have some object here, and let's say it's traveling in this direction. Well, then we might want to decompose that uh, a, a force, for example, a force of gravity that's pulling down on the object. We might want to decompose that into two vectors, one that points in the same direction as the slope and one that points perpendicular to the slope. So that when we add those components together, what we get is the original force, the vector that I've drawn in red here. So the idea is that given a vector u, which would be the vector that I've drawn in black here, and given a, uh, we can want to decompose any vector y, so y would be the red vector, into two vectors, one that's parallel to the vector u, so that would be this vector y hat, and then one that is orthogonal to u, that would be the vector z over here. So that's the general situation. So given a vector, we want to decompose it into a parallel component and an orthogonal component. But we can use some of the ideas that we've already developed. So in this case, u and z is an orthogonal basis. Remember, u was one of the given vectors, z was the component that's orthogonal that we're looking for. So we know that u and z are orthogonal to each other. And so since there's only two vectors, that must be an orthogonal basis for the plane that we get by spanning the two original vectors. And so y hat is the parallel component, the component that's parallel to the vector u. And so it's alpha really that we're looking for. We're looking for what is that coefficient, but that's exactly what the previous theorem told us how to find. And it's given by this formula, which is just the formula that we got from that previous theorem. So if that's alpha, then since y hat is alpha u, y hat is that formula multiplied by u. And so that vector y hat is what we call the orthogonal projection of y onto u. So let's do an example. Again, the picture here is that, y, that u is a given vector, and then we want to decompose y. So y points in some direction that's not parallel, in general, not parallel or perpendicular to u. 
And so what we want to do is break y up into two pieces. We want one piece to be parallel to u, and we want one piece to be orthogonal to u. So the parallel piece, that's what we were calling y hat. The orthogonal piece, that's what we were calling z. And y hat is the projection. So y hat is what we get out of that formula we just talked about. So the formula says that y hat is y dot u divided by u dot u times u. So we've got to figure out two dot products. So y dot u, that's 0 times 1, plus 3 times negative 2, plus negative 5 times 4. That's negative 26. And u dot u, that's 1 times 1, plus negative 2 times negative 2, plus 4 times 4. That's 21. And so y hat is negative 26 divided by 21 times u. And so that would be the vector negative 26 over 21, 52 over 21, and negative 104 over 21. And then if we wanted z, so if we wanted to know what z was, well then z would just be, since y hat plus z is y, that means that z is y minus y hat. And so in this case, that would be 0, 3, negative 5, minus the vector that we just came up with, negative 6 over 26 over 21, 52 over 21, negative 104 over 21. And that all works out to be 26 over 21, 11 over 21, and negative 1 over 21. 